Good morning. Today is Wednesday, the 3rd of March, and we begin with our opening sentence for morning prayer from Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence, to give thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to declare his most holy praise, his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others, those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of all their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. O go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. O come. Let us adore him. Our psalm for today is a continuation of Psalm 119. I did mention earlier in this week uh, that it is the longest psalm in the Psalter. Uh, today, Psalm 119, verses 145 through 176. But notice, as we've been reading this psalm, how often the psalmist says something to the effect of, I love your word, O Lord. I love your commandments, your statutes, your testimonies, and I trust you and I trust them. It's a wonderful message of truly meditating on God's holy word and trusting God, not blindly, but because the evidence is there. God is our creator. God is our sustainer of life. God is our savior and redeemer. God even promises us greater things. So today, beginning with verse 145. I call with my whole heart, 
Hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. Even unto you do I call, help me, and I shall keep your testimonies. Early in the morning do I cry unto you, for in your word is my trust. My eyes open before the night watches, that I may meditate on your words. Hear my voice, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Give me life according to your judgments. They draw nigh, who in malice persecute me, and are far from your law. Be near at hand, O Lord, for all your commandments are true. Concerning your testimonies, I have known long ago that you have founded them forever. O oh, consider my adversity and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and deliver me. Give me life according to your word. Salvation is far from the ungodly, for they do not regard your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your judgments. Many there are who trouble me and persecute me, yet I do not swerve from your testimonies. It grieves me when I see the transgressors, because they do not keep your law. Consider, O Lord, how I love your commandments. O give me life according to your loving kindness. Your word is true from everlasting. All the judgments of your righteousness endure forevermore. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I was glad, excuse me, I am as glad of your word as one who finds great spoils. As for lies, I hate and abhor them, but your law do I love. Seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great is the peace they have who love your law and find it no stumbling block. Lord, I have looked for your saving health and have done your commandments. My soul was, has kept your testimonies and I, am loved, and I have loved them exceedingly. I have kept your commandments and testimonies for all my ways are before you. Let my complaint come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall pour forth your praise when you have taught me your statutes. Surely my tongue shall sing of your word and all your commandments are righteous. Let your hand be strong to help me, for I have chosen your commandments. I have longed for your saving health, O Lord, and in your law is my delight. O let my soul live, and it, will, it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like sheep that is lost. O seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from chapter 10 of the book of Exodus. We continue now with the plagues. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land, so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field, and they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned 
and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long should this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Pharaoh were brought back to So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No. Go, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you're asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the, hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land and all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts has never been seen before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive my sin, please, only this once, and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, neither did nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. But Moses said, You must let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take of them to serve the Lord our God, and we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day that you see my face you shall die. Moses said, As you say, I will not see your face again. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O ruler, O Lord and ruler of the hosts of heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of all their righteous offspring, you made the heavens and the earth with all their vast array. All things quake with fear at your presence. They tremble because of your power, but your merciful promise is above all measure. It surpasses all that our minds can fathom. O Lord, you are full of compassion. You are full of compassion, long-suffering, abounding in mercy. Hold back your hand. Do not punish as we deserve. In your great goodness, Lord, you have promised forgiveness to sinners, that they may, that they may repent of their sin and be saved. And now, O oh Lord, I bend the knee of my heart and make my appeal, sure of your gracious goodness. 
I have sinned, O Lord, I have sinned, and I know my wickedness only too well. Therefore, I make this prayer to you. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Do not let me perish in my sin, nor condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O Lord, are the God of those who repent, and in me you will show forth your goodness. Unworthy as I am, you will save me in accordance with your great mercy. And I will praise you without ceasing all the days of my life. For all the powers of heaven sing your praises, and yours is the glory to ages of ages. Amen. Our second lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, beginning at the 44th verse and continuing through verse 58. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in, fine, in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one, one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked, and they said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who brings out his treasure, what is old and what is, what is new. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went out from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not, is not without honor except in his hometown, and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people, set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hand of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. When I think about the Old Testament lesson from Exodus today, you see Pharaoh's heart continues to be hardened. Again, we've talked about that, um, how that happens. God's grace, his revelation is revealed and yet rejected again and again so that calluses against that grace, against the good news, keep pushing back and hardening the heart so that it becomes nearly impenetrable uh, to receive the grace that God is pouring out upon it. It's interesting that Pharaoh is trying to strike a bargain here. He's negotiating, if you will, with God through his 
emissaries, um, Moses and Aaron, uh, okay, I'll let the men go, but the, the women and the children have to stay behind. Okay, I'll let the men and the children and the women go, but the cattle, the herds, have to stay behind. God is saying, let my people go, all of them, and Moses and, and, and Pharaoh is attempting to negotiate with the Lord God Almighty. Now, this is very different than Abraham in his negotiations with God. Remember how Abraham is seeking, he's inquiring of God when, when God's angels reveal that, they, that they've come to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their great sins. And, and, and Aaron, excuse me, and Abraham starts asking, but what if you find 50 people, 40 people? What if you find 10? And I've mentioned before, 10 is known as a minion. It's the minimum number of men in which to form and operate a synagogue. So one synagogue, one church, would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah, but they couldn't even find 10 good men. If you notice, Abraham is negotiating with God about grace and salvation. He's asking God, really, what if this? How much, how much grace will you pour out, God? And you see it's abundant. Here, Pharaoh is not negotiating grace. Pharaoh is trying to hold back a bargaining chip, something that can be held as hostage. The women, the children, the animals, the herds. Remember, the Hebrews who live in the land of Goshen, they are, they are herdsmen. And so to withhold the flock is to withhold their livelihood and their, their, their lives. And, and God will play no parts in that. And so we'll wait till tomorrow till we get our uh, final plague. Um, also, as I was reading through Psalm 119, this struck me from verse 162. Listen to these words. I am as glad of your word as one who finds great spoils. Now think of the two parables. Uh, actually, there's more than two today. But think of the parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found, covered up, and then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Or the parable of a pearl of great value. The merchant in search for fine pearls finds one of great value and went and sells everything that he had and bought it. Verse 62, I was glad of your word as one who finds great spoils. You see, there's a consistency in God's message of the great value of, um, the, and in this case, the, the teaching of Jesus's, we had the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember. Now we have, if you will, what's sometimes referred to as the, the Sermon of the Parables that Jesus has given here. And, and, and let's reflect about the rejection of Jesus for a moment. He's in his hometown. Uh, they are in awe. You know, where does this man, where does Jesus, they know him. Where does he get these, this wisdom and the mighty works? We know his father, Joseph, stepfather. We know, but they don't know that. We know his mother, we know his brothers, we know his sisters. Where does this man get this from? And they took offense at him. Uh, one of the things that, that I, re I reflect on when I think of the rejection of Jesus in his hometown is the folks there thought they knew him too well. There was a contempt because he's one of us and he's exceeding beyond us and we don't like that. Or we know him so well. We remember this kid when he was growing up. Surely he can't be the Messiah. Not Jesus, not Mary, not Joseph. Remember the scandal on how he was born? They weren't even married yet. You see, they know the story or they might know the story, but the bottom line is they know the family and they don't accept Jesus, his own hometown folks. I would argue that one of the things that we can learn from that is the danger of thinking we know Jesus, thinking we know God too well to basically become over familiar or too comfortable. Let me give you a, an example. A church that has a cemetery. Folks who 
don't really worship at the church. They're members, but you can't remember the last year that you've seen them. But they will spend money and send money for the upkeep of the cemetery. They'll buy plots for themselves and their family because they want to know where their remains are going to rest. But you have to sort of ask and struggle with, but what about the long-term place of where one goes? Are you connected to a church somewhere? You don't have to go to that one church. But you can see the misplaced priority. Oh, the church is always there. I'll always get back there someday. I'll, it's still my church. It's just, you know, the, the minister rambles on too long or whatever. I'll get there sometime, someday. Remember the, oh, what is the old song, The Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon? You know, I, I'll get there someday. Overfamiliar. It's dangerous. There's a positive thing that I want to end on today. I think that we can also learn as we reflect on the teachings, the sermon uh, with the uh, on, of, of the parables and and they kept talking about Jesus kept talking about the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like notice and we talked about this yesterday notice that Jesus his parables his examples are things that are readily familiar to people they're of nature they're of the environment he's not using esoteric um metaphorical metaphorical concepts that are way out yonder he's talking about you know mustard seeds and 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 things that people can relate to that they are familiar with in their everyday lives he's using nature if you will and the environment of the people to to help them understand the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that's been found uh, someone a merchant looking for fine pearls uh, you know, I think of a jewelry store and um, that, that's, you know, that they want to have the unique jewelry or something. Um, and, and so once they find it, the kingdom of heaven is so valuable, they sell everything and put all of their emphasis investment in the kingdom of heaven. And, and remember the message that John the Baptist, you know, we just had Zachariah's song uh, of both prophecy and and of course, blessing upon his son, Zechariah, excuse me, uh, son, John the Baptist. Um, John's sermon, if we had a title, what did he preach? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. After Jesus's baptism, we are told his message, his first sermon, if you will, is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here at the parables, the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like you jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven but notice it's in the present tense too often again that sort of over familiarity perhaps too often we think of heaven as that way off place that one day we hope to get on the ship or the train or whatever and we're going to travel way over yonder and by god's grace we'll get to heaven and yet, the scriptures, God's revelation, seem to indicate the kingdom of heaven is here, is present. I love uh, retired Bishop Tom Wright, uh, his analogy, his breakdown of this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's breaking forth. And in his teaching series, that was a video series, he started out with a beautiful photo uh, of a of a field with a lovely tree. It was all black and white. You could still see it was beautiful. I like black and white, but it, it, there it was, a, a beautiful field, a lovely tree, a panoramic view, black and white. And then at the top corner of your TV screen, color starts to come in. The kingdom of heaven is breaking forth. It's at hand. And so if we, we really focus on the positive aspect of these messages or this consistent message, the kingdom of heaven is presently at hand, then you and I have an invitation to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, not after we die, 
Not as some future goal, but to be a part of it here as it breaks forth. How does it break forth? It breaks forth by the good news. It breaks forth by people living the gospel. It breaks forth by people living and sharing the gospel, not, not in a lecture series or standing from a street corner, holding a Bible in one hand and pointing a finger at the other and yelling at people. It, 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 the kingdom of heaven breaks forth as the disciples of Jesus, that's us, live and share our faith in Jesus. You know, it, it's, it's the smile that we bring with us. Now, today with face masks, people see our eyes, they don't see our smile. And there's a wonderful kind of lesson in that. That means we need to speak. They can't see the smile behind. They might see a glimmer in the eyes, but, but my point is, is the mask makes us say good morning. If we want to really show the joy that is that smile is supposed to represent, it invites us, if you will, to engage to talk, to share. And so I don't mean that we have to go quoting verse and chapter of the Bible to people. It has value. At the right time, there may be a time that we need to share part of that story. But I'm simply saying as disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, those in relationship, let's live the life of joy of the kingdom now because it's breaking forth. Again, C.S. Lewis captures this in the Narnia series where, remember, it starts off, the place is frozen cold, ice and snow everywhere. But what's happening? There are rumors that the ice is melting. In fact, some have said they're beginning to see plants breaking through the ice, something green, life growing. The ice kingdom is melting and the kingdom of heaven is coming about. You see, you and I play a part in that now. And that's great joy. Really, it's really wonderful joy. So let's not focus on the negative because that doesn't get us very far. But if we focus on the joy that you and I, as disciples of Jesus, as children of God, as heirs of the kingdom, we can reveal the kingdom manifesting, breaking forth, showing itself right now. And it starts by the disciples reflecting and sharing the good news of their teacher, Jesus. You and I, wherever we go, when we go out to a restaurant, be kind, be thankful, be grateful. When we are in the grocery store or in the line, show patience, give courtesy, make a difference. Our world right now is consumed by demands to tear down on all sides of the political spectrum. If one was a, 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 a supporter of one member of the party, um, then their, their goal is to destroy the other party and the other member. Doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat, both seem to have the same goals. And yet the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Put aside the the desire for destruction and, and, and pointing the finger and, 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 and creating havoc and find and celebrate the joy of life that we can actually have the freedom to disagree. We have the freedom to live and to love. Our poem today is by George Herbert. And remember, God is love. Jesus stretched out his arms of love from the hardwood of the cross. Love is defined and revealed to us. True love is revealed to us through Jesus on the cross, through the actions of God over forever and ever. We'll think about that in a moment. Let's begin with reflective and thoughtful and grateful hearts as we recite together the words of our faith as found in the Apostles Creed, our baptismal covenant where the old self dies and the new creature, a creature that is of God, you and I are reborn. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us boldly and joyfully pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now enter into what's called the suffrages, these specific prayers that have the officiant say, for instance, O Lord, have, excuse me, O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and then the people respond, and grant us your salvation. May I suggest for this morning, think about them not so much as petitions as something to come into the future. Show your mercy upon us, grant us your salvation. But think of them as something affirmative that's already happened. Again, like the kingdom of heaven, not some future far off event, but it's breaking forth now, today, actually yesterday. Actually, it started breaking forth when Jesus, well, it's always been breaking forth if you really get kind of technical. But think of these prayers, not as petitions for some future event, but something that's happening, like the kingdom of heaven. O oh Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O oh Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O oh Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O oh Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O oh Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts of God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And on Wednesdays, our prayer is for grace. Remember, grace is a sort of simplified, broken down sometimes as a little acronym, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Call it prayer for grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us by your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor run into any danger, and that guided by your Spirit, we may do what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. At this time, I invite your prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings, petitions, celebrations, as the Holy Spirit places in your mind and on your heart and as you reflect about 
the, the world around you, your, your family, your friends, your work, your retirement, your church family, your community, the affairs of the country in which you live, the world in which we all occupy. Let us pray. Please join with me in praying for the people of Myanmar as they strive for democracy, particularly for safety of family, friends, and loved ones, brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for the peace in the Middle East, our brother Abraham, for a de-escalation of the enmity between peoples. Thank you, Lord, that Debbie and Albert, excuse me, Debbie and I will be, God willing, able to get the COVID vaccine next week. And we thank you for the hard work that has gone into the preparation of these vaccines. And we pray that around the world there would be relief that this plague and pestilence would be removed from us, O oh Lord. And Lord, as we reflect on the readings today, may we not take Jesus and God's grace for granted, being over-familiar and even contemptuous of Christ and his church, his body, his bride. Let us not put off today the restoration of relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the restoration of relationship with others. And, and where there is discord, echoing the prayer attributed to St. Francis, let us sow peace and love. Amen. Please join with me now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Uh, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And now George Herbert's poem, Love. Uh, George Herbert uh, was born on the 3rd of April, 1593, and he died on this day, March the 3rd, in the year 1633. Priest and poet, and uh, 
wonderful writings. If you get a chance to read George Herbert, you will not go wrong. And I noticed as I was uh, concluding morning prayer this morning, uh, we had a message from our brother, uh, Ibrahim, uh, from um, Biet Shehur, uh, the city of the shepherds in, in the Holy Land, uh, from an Hollywood factory. And uh, that, if you notice on Sunday mornings, especially during Lent, but all during Lent, on Sunday mornings for the Eucharist, uh, Holy Communion at 10 o'clock at Holy Cross, if you look closely at the altar, you will see a chalice and a paten. They're made of olive wood, and I purchased them when I was in Bethlehem on pilgrimage uh, from the Nissan Brothers uh, store in Bethlehem, very close to Manger Square, if I recall. Um, and um, during the Lenten season, I always uh, like to put the precious body and blood of Christ in a chalice of olive wood and a paten of olive wood to have that connection with the, histor the, the, the historical uh, relationship of God and the Holy Land and the, uh, the, 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 the people of the Holy Land that continue to be loved by God and therefore need to be loved and cared for by us. Re remember, uh, St. Paul, uh, fundraising efforts, uh, collection of gifts as he traveled amongst the Gentiles, was to collect and bring back to Jerusalem gifts of love, agape love from fellow Christians. And so we continue to extend our love uh, to our brother Ibrahim and all the people of the Holy Land. Well, let's, let's read about love today. And remember, God is love. So keep that in the background as we hear from George Herbert. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I'd lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful? Ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them let my shame go where it doth deserve. And you know not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. And so I did sit and eat. Let us never separate the Holy Eucharist Holy Communion, the Mass, the Lord's Supper. Let us never separate it or attempt to separate it from the sacrifice of love from the hardwood of the cross, who stretched out his hands to embrace all of humanity, who says, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, are burdened, and I, Jesus says, will give you rest. My friends, it's too early to rest today. It's just 1050. We got work to do. God willing, I will see you uh, tomorrow for morning prayer on Thursday. I remind you being Wednesday at Church of the Holy Cross, uh, excuse me, Church of the Holy Comforter, our sister parish in Sumter, uh, we have at 630 till 730 uh, our Lenten series on the love letters of Christ from the cross. And that's broadcast uh, live on the Holy Comforter Facebook page. Uh, just simply get on Facebook, Google um, on the Facebook search, Holy Comforter Sumter, and you'll be able to find it 6.30 tonight, God willing, uh, that will be broadcast. And so I look forward to having this, and it's a community-wide event, so people in Sumter are invited to come. It's not just for the internet. In fact, we would rather have you in person if at all possible. But that said, um, it's available online, 
And so that's tonight, 6.30 to 7. Uh, there'll be Compline. The teaching is about 20 minutes, followed by Compline. And it's a lovely, lovely Lenten service and discipline that the disciplines strengthen our faith, strengthen our walk, and encourage us. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is not way off yonder. It's already breaking forth, and you and I are part of it. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow.